If you're a native speaker of French, English, or German, the errors in the above sentences most likely leap off the screen at you. They're all examples of grammatical errors of agreement, in which a grammatical word doesn't match with some other grammatical feature of the sentence. If you are or have been a student of either French, English, or German, you probably know how easy these kinds of mistakes are to make. In this video, we're talking about inflectional morphology, or adding grammatical information to a word via morphological transformations. In English, the most common type of inflection is affixation. This is an easy word to remember because to affix means to stick something to something else, which is essentially what we're doing here. There are many types of affixes, and they're named by the position of the word they attach to. Prefixes attach to the front, suffixes attach to the back, interfixes attach in the middle, and circumfixes attach to both the front and back, and so on. In English, most inflectional affixes are suffixes. Before we go any further ahead, let's go over some tricky terminology. First, we have two kinds of morphemes, free and bound. Free morphemes have their own semantic meaning, and bound morphemes do not. Just remember that if you see a morpheme on its own, it's free, and if you only ever see it attached to something else, it's bound. Think of bound morphemes as always needing adult supervision. They can't go out without their parents, i.e. the free morphemes. The second bit of terminology refers to which morpheme is being stuck to which. There are three distinctions, roots, bases, and stems. These terms are based on a plant metaphor, but the confusing thing is that multiple terms can describe one part of the word at the same time. So let's use some examples. The root is the most fundamental part of the word. So the word garden could be a root because it can't be broken down into any further parts. The tricky distinction is between bases and stems. Both refer to word forms to which affixes can attach, but bases are general. So any type of affix can attach to them whereas stems can only take inflectional affixes. So when we add the derivational morpheme er to garden and create gardener, garden is the root of the word and the base onto which the affix er attaches. If we then add the inflectional morpheme s to create gardeners, then gardener is the base and the stem of the affix s. Notice that the only important distinction here is that garden cannot be considered the stem of gardener, because er is a derivational morpheme. So basically, bases and stems can have inflectional morphemes attached, but only bases can have derivational morphemes. If you want to learn more about derivational morphemes, check out our video on the topic here. We can also think about words as belonging to groups, or lexemes. In the lexeme for walk, for example, there are four inflected forms walk, walks, walking, and walked, each of which contains the same semantic information, i.e. the action of walking, but they all differ in terms of the grammatical information that's encoded in them. At the center of the lexeme is the lemma, or the root, walk. The lemma undergoes morphological inflection to produce the other inflected forms. This can include information regarding person, number, degree of comparison, gender, or case. To better understand these types of information, let's look at some examples. If we take a sentence like, blank walks to the store every morning, we know the S in walks encodes information about grammatical person. This is because there are some constraints on what can fill the blank. For example, the sentence is, I walks to the store every morning, you walks to the store every morning, we walks to the store every morning, would all be ungrammatical. The grammatical person would not be consistent between the verb and the pronoun. When we see the S in walks, we know that we need a third person singular pronoun in the blank position. The same is true for a grammatical number. Consider this sentence. She saw blank whales during the trip. They were beautiful. Since the suffix s in whales encodes plural number in nouns, we know that she saw more than one, 
and a plural quantifier is needed to fill the blank. Irregular plural forms are also considered to be inflected forms. So for example, geese would be the plural inflected form of goose. As a side note, you may have noticed that the S in English is incredibly frustrating to learn for second language speakers, because depending on the context, it can encode either number or person. And in the case of grammatical person, none of the other categories are explicitly encoded, making it very tricky to remember when to inflect and when not to. In English, degree of comparison is also encoded in some adjectives through inflection. For instance, the lemma big is inflected as bigger for comparative and biggest for superlative. Returning to the grammatical errors at the beginning of the video, you might be aware that French encodes grammatical gender, which makes French notoriously difficult to learn for those people coming from languages that don't encode it, such as English. An example of this is how adjectives describing masculine and feminine nouns are inflected differently, as in the examples below. In this case, nouveau is considered the lemma from which these forms are inflected. In German, there are inflected forms for grammatical case. The easiest way to understand grammatical case, if you haven't been exposed to it already, is through the English pronoun system, which is the only instance where it plays a role in the language. For instance, the first person pronoun that you use differs depending on whether you're the subject or object of the sentence. So, I like my dog versus my dog likes me. I is the pronoun in the nominative case, me is in the accusative case, and my is in the genitive case. Where this differs in German is that other words are also inflected for case. For instance, let's compare the two sentences below. One meaning, I see the nice man, and the other meaning, the nice man sees me. You'll notice that the adjective nice, or net, is inflected in the accusative case in den netten Mann, and in the nominative case in der netten Mann. This is a feature of German that many learners have trouble with, especially those coming from languages that don't encode case. Finally, you're probably very aware that in English, verbs are inflected to encode information about tense and aspect as in the simple past tense, walk plus ed, or walked, or the continuous aspect, walk plus ing, walking. Irregular verbs in English are also considered to undergo inflectional morphology, so ran would be an inflected form of run. So to conclude, inflectional morphology is all about the creation of word forms that retain the semantic information of the lemma that also contain grammatical information relative to the sentence. Here, we've only talked about affixation as a method of inflection, but others do exist. For instance, reduplication, or the repeating of a word, can also be used for inflection. In Thai, reduplication is used extensively in both derivational and inflectional morphology. For example, it can encode grammatical number, as in dek, which means child, and dek dek, which means children. Hopefully that helps to clarify inflectional morphology. Leave any questions or requests in the comments, and thanks for watching.